So welcome to our session. Um, as we continue our past files plus renewables equals net zero energy theme tonight with getting to zero net zero past files case studies. We have a, a few excellent examples. So I have two listed here that we're going to focus the night on. Uh, Bessie Harper will be talking about uh, a project in Cambridge um, uh, uh, that's been styled to be a uh, Victorian uh, home that's net zero and David Hall will be talking about an innovative new uh, a townhome complex up in Newburyport the Hillside Center. So I'm really really excited to be watching uh, to be having both of them here. Uh, I'm going to be talking about it a little bit here at the beginning but then I'll turn it over to, to both of them to carry through the night and after they're speaking we'll uh, welcome questions from all of you. So as I mentioned you can feel free to use the chat room during the presentations to type those questions out. Uh, you can also ask them directly at the end as well. Um, but I like the chat room during the presentation. It allows everybody can kind of contribute uh, while everyone else is presenting. So we're going to just go ahead and get started. So like I said, this is continuing the theme we've been talking about all year long um, on this public campaign promoting the role of Passive House in achieving net zero energy. Uh, we really believe that Passive House is the platform for net zero energy. It's the, the proven way to do it uh, through not only do we have built examples, but we have the quality assurance that Passive House provides, the third party verification. It's the essential platform for as the state and municipalities in the area are moving towards net zero goals, Passive House is essential. So it's what we've been talking about. We've been talking about it every Tuesday um, as well as coming up at our symposium. So save the date and join us Wednesday, November 3rd. Really excited to announce that we are going to be returning to a live in person event. So we'll have more details coming out about this, but we, we do wanna welcome everybody who can make it to join us in person once again. Um, the details, you can find passfile or phmass.org slash symposium, but we'll be posting more details, sending out newsletters as, as we go. But for now, please save the date for Wednesday, November 3rd. And I, I really hope to see as many of you who can make it in person. It's been, been far too long. So we're gonna have a pretty good celebration that day. Um, much sooner, uh, we have the new uh, Gravity Housing Conference, uh, so put on through partners of ours, but we're not directly involved, but uh, definitely going to be there and hope to see you guys as well. It's online this year like it was last year, July 21st through 22nd. Uh, there's a link on our website that you can go to. You can also just Google New Gravity or go to the Pass House Accelerator, all those resources, you'll find the registration. But if you can uh, go to this one, there'll be some great sessions. Most of this is on uh, larger multifamily housing, some great, great um, case studies they'll be showing there. Um, also wanted to talk about some of the EAC public comments. This is something that uh, I've been highlighting the last you know, couple months. Hank Keating has been talking about here in these meetings as well. So you've heard us mention it, uh, but it's really critical. This is how the next three years of the statewide energy efficiency budget will be spent. And the draft plan is out. They're still taking comments on it. Um, last month, I was talking about some of the listening sessions that were happening in June. Now in July, they're having a couple more sessions. So tomorrow, the 14th, they have one. And then in a few weeks on the 28th, we're definitely looking for more people to make comments at these sessions um, in writing as well as in person. So in person is virtual over Zoom and you just get to talk and, and, and make your comments directly. It's a great way to get, get your opinion across and get your support of Passive House Buildings heard. We made a lot of um, recommendations. You can find all of those on our website, phmass.com slash policy. So if you haven't already, you can kind of see the recommendations we made for the continuation of this program and the expansion of it into retrofits and into smaller buildings. But please, if you can, send in some comments or volunteer to speak in person at one of these upcoming sessions. So now we get into a nice topic. We're going to actually be talking about some case studies of some smaller projects. Um, so we have the one on the left, which Bessie Harper will be talking about in a moment in Cambridge. And then on the right, uh, David Hall is here to tell us about that project up in Newburyport. Uh, so two very good projects. I'm really excited uh, to have you guys here for them. And again, ask questions in, in the chat room if you have them. Um, I'm going to take just a couple moments very quickly to talk about this project in, in Newton, the Auburndale Builders office. Uh, many of you guys have heard me talk about this before, or you've heard the owner of the, of the building, Nick Falkoff, talk about it. Um, so tonight I'm not going to get into the construction details of it or the way it was built. I want to show you some data. This building has been around for now for a couple of years in operation. So we have some pretty good data to look at how this is performing. So we're going to, we're going to see that today. 
Um, just as a refresher for folks who may not be familiar with it, this was a, a retrofit. It was an old sort of concrete warehouse building in the back of a in the back of sort of a mixed use lot in Newton that Auburndale Builders retrofitted into be to be their office. They had an old existing office somewhere else in Newton. They relocated here. And you can see some of the things they did. They used a lot of uh, rock wool insulation, both under the slab and, and on the walls. They used some air barrier systems there on the inside. Uh, that bottom right photo is showing you some of the uh, salvaged foam insulation they used on the roof. So they actually, from some of the other projects they were working on and some other sources, they used some salvaged foam for, for roof insulation. But those are just some of the details. Um, this building was became the first uh, FIA certified office building in the state. So it's sort of notable for being the first office, even though it was such a small scale building, they, they did achieve certification and they became, became FIA certified. They, they set out to do that. They worked on that hard, but they did not set out to necessarily be net zero. Uh, what we'll see tonight though, is that they, they achieved that. This became a net zero project. And part of the reason is through the design process, as they were getting into the details, they came up with this innovative net or innovative solar awning system that you see in the top photo there. So that's one of the things that I wanna talk about here today. So when I say they here, I'm talking a lot about uh, Nick Falcoff at Auburn Builders, as well as our past house consultant, uh, Michael Hindle, who some of you may have worked with before as well. Uh, but this is one of the things they came up with for, for the solar aspect of it. This is just kind of showing you uh, really the angle of sunlight coming down um, at different times of the year, hitting that awning. And that awning served two purposes. One was to actually be a shade so that they would block out some of the solar heat gain in the summer months from going in those uh, south facing windows in the front of the building. But the other was to position the solar panels at the right angle to maximize their production. And we're gonna see how that turned out. So I have two pieces of data. This is coming from one is their WUFI actually energy model um, for, for achieving the FIA certification. And the other is site sage monitoring. So this has been an ongoing monitoring system that they've used to monitor the energy use of the building, uh, the PV production um, and the purse kind of circuit uh, energy production. So we're not going to use look at that in detail today, but it is an interesting thing to know that there's looking at sort of each individual circuit to see how how that's performing. So sort of a great way to monitor energy use of a building. So let's look at the overall energy use. So what we're seeing in this chart in the blue on the left is the model energy performance coming from the Wufi model. So just over 6,000 kilowatt hours a year, and this is in source energy. Um, the green bar was the actual energy use, and this was for the year 2019. And you can see the energy use came out about 15% higher than modeled. Um, you get down to the orange and yellow, and what you're seeing is the energy use with solar production accounted into. So the building became net positive when PV production was factored in. So they produced more energy from the solar panels than they used. And the PV production itself was actually a little higher than modeled. Um, so they didn't model some PV production into the Wufi model, but it uh, ended up being a little bit higher. They got more, they got slightly higher production numbers than they thought they would. But overall, a net positive building. And this is taking a look at the year overall in 2019. So you can sort of see the, the gold or yellow color is the production, uh, the blue is the usage. So you can sort of see the months at the beginning of the year in January and February when usage was higher than production. And then as it goes through the through the year, production becomes much higher than usage. And the green is showing you the net. So the beginning of the year, January, February, there were, was no net gain. They were using energy, but then throughout the summer months and even into the fall, uh, they produced so much extra energy that overall net positive. I'm gonna go back to this slide at, for a moment to just mention this is 2019 data. I also have 2020 data, but the reason I'm showing you 2019 is 2020 is a little, you know, it's a little harder to to gauge because of because of COVID, the building was occupied a lot less frequently and unpredictability or unpredictable. Um, the green bar, though, for 2020 would be lower than the blue one. It was right around that 4,000 uh, kilowatt hour number. So in 2020, it was significantly lower than than model. Though again, COVID had some some impact on that. So here's the roof space. And this is kind of the thing I want to highlight. Because when I've talked about this before, one of the questions that folks have asked is, well, they only use solar on the awning. They have this huge empty roof space. And couldn't they simply have added more solar panels to the roof? Um, did they need to hit the energy reduction that they did by being certified passive house? Could they have used less insulation? Could they have used double pane windows instead of the triple pane or even quadruple pane they use in this project and still got to net zero? And the answer is probably yes. They probably could have put solar on that roof. But that's sort of missing the larger point. 
which is that in order to really maximize what we're trying to do, which is reduce energy use, reduce carbon use, we want to focus on reducing energy demand significantly first, then simply using enough solar to offset that. So that roof space is there, it's available, and they can do other things with it. In this case, they're now adding a green roof, so roof, roof garden to the top of that roof. So rather than solar panels everywhere that you see, they only have them on the awning, and now they get to use that roof space for something else. And because they were able to be certified passive house and go through that drastic energy reduction, they were able to achieve net zero energy, um, even with just the awning of solar and now the whole roof. So that sort of hits at some of the points about what makes passive house such a, I think, a critical element of getting to net zero. It's focused on the energy reduction first. In this case, that was the only thing they were focused on. It was only through the design they realized that maybe they could get to net zero if they put this, this solar there. So that's what I wanted to mention and kind of just show off some things about this. Happy to ask them answer some questions about this at the end, but I want to turn things over to our other speakers tonight. Um, so I'm first going to introduce Bessie Harper, and then uh, she'll talk about her project in Cambridge, and then we'll have David Hall join us to talk about the project up in Newburyport. So Bessie, I'm going to stop my screen and give you permission to share yours, and we'll turn it over. Let's see. All right, perfect. I can see your screen. Okay, now I just need to move this over so that I can get to the slideshow view. Oops. Um, slideshow view, let's go here. Hmm. Why isn't it doing that oh. for me? Let's do slideshow one more time and then yep. there we go. Okay, there we go. Okay. Um, well, I am Betsy Harper. I am a member actually of the Passive House Massachusetts board, um, probably the least technical person on the board. My background is in policy work. I used to work for um, the um, state um, DHCD, the Department of um, Housing and Community Development. And I was the sustainability director there trying to make um, our existing housing stock for uh, affordable housing more sustainable. And um, ultimately, after many years there, I decided that I really was much more interested in passive house. And um, I really wanted to try to build one myself. Um, not something that I would live in, but something that I wanted to see whether or not the market would um, be interested in, and that I could sell ultimately. A three year process. Um, didn't know it was going to take me that long and a lot of learning along the way. So let's get started. Um, my project goals were definitely to build a passive house. I was very committed to getting certified, but um, very specifically, I didn't want to use what I saw mostly, um, even in, in some of the single family buildings, mostly modern um, boxier types of architecture. I live in a Victorian in Newton and I love the architecture. Um, but I hate all the performance of the house. Um, it's got a terrible building envelope. It's leaky, drafty, uncomfortable. Um, the materials are constantly um, failing on me. Um, you know, I, it's uh, a maintenance, you know, typical Victorian, not nightmare, but challenge. Um, and I wanted to see whether I could replicate this type of architecture or anything that was really a complex form um, that would be a passive house and, and meet the certification standards. Secondly, I wanted to test whether the market would value this, whether they would, you know, may not understand a, a passive house type of certification, but high performance um, was clearly going to be what I was marketing. And I wasn't sure at the beginning whether it would be a single or a two family. I actually thought it would be a two family. Um, and I was hoping that the market would pay me enough at the end of this process to break even financially. Um, I'm not a typical developer, never done this before, didn't have elaborate pro formas of what I was trying to look for, my NOI. Um, I just wanted to, to follow my passion, teach some people along the way and, um, and hopefully break even. So that was the third goal, to educate and increase passive house awareness and adoption. And um, it was really critical that I chose uh, the design build firm that I did, Group Design Build with Tagore Hernandez as um, the main principal there. 
He, um, Tagore is somebody who has been a professor at the BSA before, um, is very committed again to increasing passive pass awareness. Um, we've made videos that we're gonna distribute um, quite uh, widely. And um, not only in all the performance characteristics we'll, we'll go into, but just his passion about getting the word out and making this um, something that that more people understood. And and you know, typically his clients are are um, homeowners, and so they're very proud of their homes, but they don't really uh, enable the kind of education that I was really hoping for in putting this out to to market for a much bigger audience. I had certification goals. Um, as I said, the primary was Passive House. Um, I really was focused on that as my major interest. Um, we, I did uh, enable, uh, I wasn't able, able to put into the contracts um, specifically that I was looking for at least certifiability, the ability that we hoped that we were going to get to Passive House and to require a minimum um, 0.6 ACH at the Pascal 50. So that was, you know, pretty unusual. I knew that my, uh, my contractor was really on board when, when they decided that they were willing to, to put that into their contract. And then a secondary goal, which really even three years ago was not as much in my parlance anyway, um, not as much in the parlance of the, the Passive House Massachusetts board, but very much now obviously growing in the, in the marketplace, um, zero net energy. Um, it wasn't clear that we were gonna make it. It wasn't my primary goal, but certainly um, I thought, you know, if we could, that would be a, a bonus. Um, the third goal was lead platinum. I, I'm never promoting lead um, all that much, but uh, the market awareness of just the lead name I knew would have cachet and therefore higher market valuation. So um, I wanted to, to make sure that we could hit lead platinum, which I thought would be relatively easy to do. The, so we had a design challenge. Um, the easiest way, obviously, to minimize thirds thermal bridging um, and air infiltration is to build a, a very um, simple boxy type of form. Um, but in contrast, Victorians have all kinds of, you know, bumped outs, bays, gables, uh, complex roof lines. And these introduce challenges and opportunities for air to infiltrate at each one of those connections um, of their, each connection of the plane, each plane. Um, there was no known Victorian certified passive house that I know of in the world. <laughs> Nobody has, has tried to do this. Um, and I just say I had this naive passion. I just was you know, committed to trying and seeing whether or not we could make it. So I looked for a, a property to buy and um, I had a very unusual criteria. I really wanted a building that was a health hazard that was ugly as sin, that was, you know, having, you know, major problems with, with its, um, you know, exterior that really could be turned, torn down without me feeling, um, you know, bad about it. I'm, I'm not um, an advocate for, for developer teardowns, but there are some buildings which really do need to be torn down. And this was one of them. So it was well beyond its useful life. It couldn't be renovated to modern building um, living standards. It was only 18 inches away from the abutter um, on one side. So there was no air and sunlight that was getting through on that side. And um, I just felt that the, you know, the house needed to be recited um, on a different, uh, farther away from that abutter on a better part of the lot. It also, I was very attracted to the fact that it was a corner lot so that um, I was gonna get a lot more sun and air light air from two sides um, because a lot of uh, lots in Cambridge are very narrow, rectangular, very deep lots and the houses um, don't get very much sunlight on either side. So this was, this was an opportunity to get really great um, northern, eastern and southern light. Um, Teardowns are permitted in Cambridge after just waiting six months for any building that's over 50 um, years old. But I really wanted the historical commission to buy in, to, to really be excited about this, to get again educated about what you could do um, replacing this old building with a high performing passive house. They're, that's not their mission. They, <laughs> their mission is to decide whether a existing building is pr preferentially preserved is their term. Um, it was easily determined that this building was not. 
But um, I was really, again, seeking that, you know, somebody getting excited about um, Passive House. They never gave me any indication of that in my two hearings, but um, one, one board member at the end did actually applaud me for, for doing this and felt that it was a um, really important example in the city. And um, this was, is only the second um, Passive House um, that will be certified in Cambridge. So while you think Cambridge is a very, you know, liberal and um, for, you know, at the, at the forefront of all kinds of intellectual thought, um, the Passive House is, is still not very, um, not very common even within Cambridge. Um, and I was originally trying to create this as a, another two family because obviously I wanted to maximize the density um, just for carbon reasons. And um, I felt that that would be simple because really sort of 50% of the houses on this street, Stern Street, um, which is near Porter Square, um, are two families. It's a, it's a you know relatively modest neighborhood. Um, not Avon Hill, but near there. Observatory Hill, which is no one's ever heard about, <laughs> of really. Um, but my neighbors were adamant that they didn't want me to create another two family, which I found, I, I found baffling. Um, actually, what I found ultimately was my neighbors just didn't want me to tear down the building and create anything. That change is always bad. Um, they saw me as a typical developer. They never came around to really valuing the fact that I was going to create a passive house. Um, I had nine neighborhood meetings, and every time I was really trying to get them to love me, appreciate me, something, um, they really never did. And there are some people on the street who to this day, don't talk to me, didn't come to the neighborhood open house that I held for them, <laughs> whatever. Um, I finally came to came to terms with it, that that wasn't, you know, while I was trying to educate people and, and you know, promote this awareness, that it might not be the people on my block who were gonna be educated. And that's, you know, that was okay. Um, but I did ultimately go along with their preference to not have it be a two family in part because a realtor did tell me that he felt that I would get um, a higher valuation for a single family. And because I was actually pretty darn nervous at the beginning that I'd even get my money back, um, I decided to, to, go, um, to go along with both the neighbors and the realtor advice. So I was sad to give up the two family idea, but um, it's, it's worked out to, to be a beautiful house in the end. I had a lot of design requirements. Um, the I needed a full basement. I bought the land for, <laughs> I'll just tell you, $1.6 million, um, a little postage stamp of land um, in Cambridge. And so I really needed to be able to make that basement usable space and, and maximize the, the FAR. Um, so in fact, one of the five bedrooms, and it Came, became a five bedroom house. Um, one of the five bedrooms, which really, you know, I think would be a better office is in, is in the basement um, with a full bathroom downstairs as well. I knew I wanted a PV array. And one of the reasons, again, I'd bought this lot was because the backyard was almost due um, south facing. And so while we, the front of the house was very much um, in line with a Victorian style um, with some complex roof um, the designs and some um, valleys, in the back, it's just a, a flat plane. Um, oriented again, almost due south, and um, it faces the backyard. You actually can't even see the panels if you're standing in the backyard um, because they're so unobtrusive, and that was important to me. Um, I have a very big, you know, nature theme. I'm a, a, an athlete, an outdoors person, and I really wanted to bring nature indoors as much as possible and residents outdoors. So it was very important, the connection that I had with the backyard and with nature. And we ended up putting all um, native plants in to, you know, attract bees and butterflies and birds. Um, it actually, this little place is an, an oasis, a really beautiful, um, quiet oasis from, um, the urban sites that are, are nearby, but um, but not this this lot was beautiful and, and very quiet and and uh, full of nature. Um, just for marketability, I needed two parking spots. Um, at the last minute, I 
did a wing change order um, on my architect and decided I wanted to add a carport because again, that would um, enhance my market valuation. Um, EV charging was always a part of the plan, but um, it was easy to put have a location for it once we had a carport. And you'll see it's a very modern, sleek, very different kind of carport. Um, and all electric was obviously another goal. However, um, there are a lot of buyers in in Cambridge, um, there's some Asian buyers and other people who really have a very strong preference for gas cooktops. So I debated this and had nightmares about this. And you know, what do I do about the possibility of a buyer needing to have gas? And ultimately decided that I wouldn't put in a connection to the street, but that I would put the internal um, piping within the house. Because obviously, as you know, with Passive House, once it's built, putting in a new penetration is just not an option. So I, I need to, to um, do that just um, on the, you know, chance that we had a buyer who wouldn't buy the house other than um, for the for the cooktop. So um, interestingly, we didn't hear that from the marketplace when we were selling it. Um, we really had very or I wasn't aware of any conversation about the electric um, induction that in fact, it's being much more accepted now. So I'm very happy to see that. The basement construction, you know, was all new to me. It was very exciting. Um, obviously it's the critical first step. And I was there every day just in awe of the precision of what goes on. Um, we had a very um, difficult, site in, in terms of it just being clay. They um, actually used to make bricks in this area. It was just deep, deep clay. They dug, dug down 12 feet and it was just, you know, nothing but clay. And the basement is, you know, four feet below the water table. Um, I'll talk about the other um, uh, layers or the other floors in a minute. Um, and the reason we need to have um, exacting measurements to ensure that the basement walls were exactly um, level at the top. I remember my um, architect calling me and saying that he'd shot some laser beams at night and he found that, you know, a couple of the walls were an eighth of an inch off. And I was like, wow, that's fabulous. And he said, no, don't worry, we'll fix it. <laughs> so I was like, whoa, <laughs> you really, and then you're like, you start with an inch, eighth of an inch off at the bottom, you're going to have more problems than by the third floor. Um, you know, for high performance materials that you're pretty familiar with. Um, but my goal with throughout the house was try to minimize the amount of foam that we used. And the only place we really used um, any significant foam was, was in the basement um, for the EPS um, below the slab and then the ICF forms. Um, so what um, I decided to buy for the, the other uh, parts of the house was insurance by having it um, prefabbed by EcoCore in Maine. And um, I bought that insurance because again, I just had no idea how difficult it would be with this complex form to create, um, a, a tr you know, hit our passive house metrics. Um, as I realized um, some of the huge value in, you know, the, the factory assembly of the, of the walls and, and roofs, is um, not the individual components, you know, that are used um, more and more, but really the ad, the um, adhere, adhering um, of those components in a very climate controlled way, as you know, and on a horizontal conveyor belt, um, and um, the exacting uh, tolerances that come out of that type of um, uh, construction. And we also, I was very, um, interested in making sure that the window and doors, you know, we I'd seen them been in a workshop and try to install a window uh, myself, at, you know, a through triple pane tilt and turn and um, you know, having it done in the factory is just um, so much, so much uh, more airtight. So we did choose um, CDM doors and windows that are made in Poland. Um, <laughs> they're, they're heavy as sin, but they, you know, they tilt and turn very, very smoothly. They're Fabulous. I wish I had those in my own house. Um, and and um, I'll talk about just the, the cost premium for that in a minute. So was um, prefab worth the cost premium? It did cost me more. Um, a, the premium above stick built was um, $60,000 just for the construction. Um, that was 17% of the core shell, which sounded like a lot to me. But really, when you think about it, it was only 3% of the total construction cost. 
So um, that 60,000 does not include um, $90,000 for the windows and doors, um, because I don't know how to compare it to what my window and door package would have been otherwise, um, probably the same um, stick built. And it doesn't include um, the, the EcoCore um, installation of the Gutex, the wood fiber board that's from Germany um, that costs $14,000. But we installed um, this whole house, went the entire house went up in, in 10 days, um, 90 panels, um, instead of what they had estimated um, stick built for four months. So obviously in terms of my construction loan, I avoided um, $8,000 of interest costs um, for that differential. And then I got lucky, um, there, <laughs> COVID happened um, in the middle of, of my construction process. And um, materials costs skyrocketed, particularly two by fours, as, as you know, um, and other types of materials. So, you know, would that have cost me $30,000 more? I don't know. Um, but I had a fixed contract, you know, early on um, with uh, EcoCore. So I didn't, I wasn't exposed to any of those material costs. And then, um, you know, you can't put a price on the knowledge transfer. Um, EcoCore is a fabulous group, um, small, but, but, really high quality. Um, and group design build, my architect um, and, and builder had never done a panelized system before. And, you know, I was a little nervous about them never having done it. Um, they have built um, the other um, passive house, certified passive house in Cambridge. Um, but the whole eco course philosophy is to not have their core, their group anymore do the installation, but to really transfer knowledge to um, local builders. And so they just sent down one person um, to be there to oversee the, the process. And um, there were five people from Group Design Build who uh, picked it up very easily. Um, it, the installation was incredibly smooth. And, um, and Group Design Build has now um, decided that the, you know, the quality is so much higher uh, that they're now using it with many other clients. They're introducing it um, to, to all their clients um, as a preferred way to go. So I just went backwards. Um, we did put in a, a, you know, a relatively for a single family home, large solar array. Um, as I talked about, I, you know, I wanted the aesthetics to be really hidden um, so that uh, neighbors couldn't complain about that. And um, we ran the model and um, came up with a very low energy um, expected load. Um, and the solar production is 20% higher than, than we anticipate. Now the proof is in the pudding. We don't know, you know, we, the house is sold. Um, we have a, a family of just um, four to a couple and their two children. Um, we don't know what their energy use will actually be, but um, we'll, be, we'll be monitoring that and I'll be very curious as to, as to how that's gonna work out. Um, hoping that we get the same results that, that uh, Nick got um, in having a, a much higher solar production and, and uh, not very much energy use. Um, so we, you know, performed. We didn't know we were going to, but we performed. And our um, first blower door test was crazy. Um, 0.24 ACH at 50 Pascal, way below the 0.6 that I was um, anticipating. And um, much, much lower than, you know, the other passive house um, building a house that this, our group design build had, had built. They were actually over, didn't make the 0.6 on their first lower door and had to do a lot of running around chasing um, air infiltration leaks. But these panels are so tightly um, adhered and the, the materials, as I said, are so tightly um, sandwiched together in their assembly that we just blew, you know, the, the, our socks off with, um, with our numbers. So that was exciting. We've since done two other blower door tests and the numbers haven't changed. They've stayed exactly the same at, at 0.24. As I showed, we're, you know, net energy positive. Um, we've had um, our HERS um, uh, evaluation done recently, but not the final um, uh, scoring of it yet, but we're anticipating a net negative 12. Um, easily um, meeting the lead platinum goal. Um, our anticipated score is at 90. 
Um, but I just want to say over and over again that none of this performance would ever have happened um, just from my vision. It really, the critical contributor was um, my design build firm, um, group design build. I call them my firm, I, they, <laughs> the firm, but um, it's been a three-year process and they have felt very much like a partner all the way. Um, and they are, um, I just can't say enough about um, their ability to um, be creative when there are, you know, inevitable problems that come along um, to, to, you know, utilize their incredible experience. Um, they're becoming one of the premier known um, building uh, builders of um, passive house buildings in the area. And um, they were really the reason that this house sings and is as beautiful as it is. Um, the marketing was much more successful than I ever thought. Um, the house sold immediately. Um, we had three competing bids and that was just, you know, what the realtor saying, you got to get your bids in within the next three days. Um, so we would have had more had we, you know, had a longer sales period. Um, and the winning bid was, you know, one of the highest dollars per square foot um, in Cambridge um, recently. So that was amazing to me. Um, but I put it in context. I got lucky. I got real lucky. Um, this was a really hot real estate market, um, especially for new construction in Cambridge. And there just isn't this type of product on the market. There is no other passive house that is a spec house that's being sold in, um, you know, to um, through a realtor um, in Cambridge. So it it became a very unique um, item that a lot of people were very interested in. So I go back to you know how important were the the you know um, <clears throat> the certifications the passive house that net energy positive um, lead platinum obviously it's impossible to know um, we likely didn't need passive house certification although you know the the um, the new owners have asked for us um, next week to go through the house with them, with the architect and myself to go through and explain all the, the elements of passive house to them. So, so there's knowledge transfer to them. And they specifically asked about passive house, not um, the my realtors really focused on lead and um, zero net energy, because those are the terms that really were familiar in the marketplace and they thought would carry the cachet. Um, but, um, you know, it's it's interesting. I think you know, I'm I'm very pleased that that a lot of people at least now have this vernacular of passive house. Um, but I, I'll show you some pictures. I will say that the aesthetics and the construction quality were really the wow points. That's what people see on the outside that finishes. You know, I had never bought any of these finishes before, but I spent a lot of time. This was my baby for three years. I spent a lot of time trying to to find um, good value, but but high quality um, and modern interior um, finishes. So the education awareness, um, you know, we had tours during the construction. We had students, professors, architects, engineers, policymakers from my old life, um, a few builders. Um, we had problems with COVID, you know, it was hard to get people to the site um, because of, of those restrictions. But um, in the marketing phase, you know, I've had um, two major um, magazine articles written about the house um, or about me as a, naive, you know, first time developer, um, the one little uh, magazine article. Um, I did some lunch and learns for real estate brokers. And really, this became, you know, the first time they were introduced to this concept. So I had a box of materials that I took out and showed them all the different things that went into the wall assemblies. Um, and they got excited. And, um, and, you know, we had a lot of buyers that were very interested in this concept. So you know, we educated um, 100 new people, home, potential homeowners on, uh, is just a, a vague estimate. So here are some pictures. Um, this is, you know, what the house looks like um, from the front. Um, and this is the interior. As I said, it's a very modern interior, very open floor plan. Um, the left is the kitchen, the, um, the right is the view into the dining room and the living room. Um, this is my carport on the left-hand side. It looks to me like it, you know, is one that dessert, you know, it should be in a modern art museum. Um, and then on the southern, you're looking at the southern facade here. There's a balcony with a 
very large screening um, system. Partly that's to screen out um, the solar heat gain in the summer, but also it's to block some of the um, views of the neighbors in the back, which are not particularly beautiful homes. <laughs> so we did that. Um, it was a dual function of having that of that um, balcony out there. Um, this is the basement. This is the you know bat the um, bedroom slash office in the basement, and um, I'm sure the photographer used uh, some you know some lights, but um, the oversized window wells, um, the, we put in a Pergo uh, floating wood floor. Um, it really feels like very livable space in the basement. It does not smell and will not smell um, uh, anything like the basement for the life of the house. I'm convinced it's, it's really wonderful down there. And then just, you know, I put in some um, pictures of the of the lighting because that was kind of fun to, to do as well. Um, and you get the sense that porch um, in the front took a lot of <laughs> a lot of work. Um, it's rounded on both sides because this is one entrance. It was supposed to be a two family. And so there was supposed to be another entrance on the other side. Um, and a lot of people commented they loved the porch. They loved the rounded porch. And you know it was it was um, tricky to build. It was, um, you know, he had to use ma uh, marine wood, put it in, you know, wet it, put it in jigs, you know, slowly bend it over time. And then my architect was determined to take out, um, have as few columns as possible um, supporting that, that roof. So, um, so, you know, we don't have a lot of columns blocking the view. So that's really all I have for now. I look forward to your questions later. Um, and um, it's my favorite topic, so I could talk forever about it. All right, Aaron, back to you. Thank you, Betsy. Uh, tremendous project. And yeah, we, we do have some questions already in the chat room. We'll get to them here at the end. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to our next speaker, David Hall, to talk about the uh, Hillside uh, uh, Center for Sustainable Living up in Newburyport, uh, another incredible project um, of, a, of a different scale. Uh, so. David, you should have uh, the ability to share your slides and, and you can take it away. Share there, Aaron. Okay. Uh, Hold on one sec. Yeah, I was going to say we have a screen, but it might not be uh, the slides that you're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Come on. All right, here we go. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak tonight to everybody. Um, Betsy, that is an absolutely beautiful house. <laughs> wow. Um, so uh, my name is David Hall. I am the partner of Keith Moscow. Um, we are Hall in Moscow, known as Hall in Moscow in Newburyport. And together we have developed um, about 90,000 square feet of commercial space and 25 or so small multifamily, all of which have been, oh, I'm putting it. Um, but that's not, I'm sorry, you guys, hold on one sec. Present. No, sorry. What the heck is going All on? right, we uh, it's full screen on a video here. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you, you let you know what oh, I it's see. Full screen on. It, okay. it was a moment ago. It's no longer full screen. Okay. But we see your title slide now. And and the rest, but you also we see oh. the rest as well. Yes. Now you yeah. okay. Now here. it's full screen. We see it all. Okay. The evening's a success. Um. 
All right. So yeah, David Hall, partner of Keith Moscow, known as Hall Moscow New Report. And we've been at um, the, the rental real estate market for residential for a long time. Also done a lot of commercial development together. When I said development, it's generally acquisition, rehab and rent, uh, not sell. Um, so we're always trying to create a product that it serves both we, the owners, and the resident effectively. Um, and in Newburyport, um, an opportunity came up just after the last recession um, that we couldn't turn down. Um, for those of you who know Newburyport, it's beautiful. There's a, um, a, an enormous quantity of federal architecture absolutely gorgeous. We're right on the Merrimack River and next to the Parker River Wildlife Refuge. Um, if you haven't been here, make sure to come up. This is the site. Um, it is uh, approximately four and a half acres, although we had to acquire some additional lots. In the 30s, a farmer used it as a dumping spot for coal ash. Um, and, um, and which we all had to remove. And then after that, uh, it was a sort of a, 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 um, a scrapyard for a local um, landscaper. And he had about 75 old vehicles there. Um, and so we acquired we acquired, this is the main body of the site here, but these lots next to Route 1 um, took quite a while to acquire. It was about two and a half years in permitting. Um, a new report like Cambridge, and as Betsy described, I can relate to her experience. Um, very, it's very difficult to get multifamily permitted. We were successful that way. Um, and we were able, uh, with a great deal of help from the city of Newburyport, the mayor, council members, building department, to get a permits for a community of 48 units um, and a 10 room SRO. Um, and the 10, the SRO is it's 10 private rooms with their own bathroom and those people share a kitchen. Those units are extremely affordable for those on very limited in incomes. Um, yeah, and um, so the idea is that we create a resilient community that has a small carbon footprint. And um, <laughs> It's been a long odyssey. Uh, so <clears throat> the focus for us was food, housing, and transportation. Um, most people on tuning in tonight, I'm sure are aware of how powerful the food component is of our carbon footprint. So we recruited uh, Whole Systems Design, which is a permaculture firm um, originated in Burlington, Vermont, or Vermont. And they've done some really terrific projects throughout New England. Um, Cornelius Murphy in particular helped us with our design here. We committed all the available planting space to edible landscaping. Um, and that runs the gamut from pear trees to gooseberry, um, 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 and then if, if someone's interested, I'm happy to share you with you all that information, but this is a really important aspect of this project. So I, I want you to leave tonight knowing that um, this is really important. Um, eating plants is a big deal now. On housing, of course, um, the focus of tonight's uh, presentation, we wanted super efficient units. So um, 
and we pursued passive house, we have pursued passive house standards and we platinum. And I think we're comfortably um, gonna hit both those uh, goals. And lastly, transportation. We have uh, quite a bit more solar on the property than is needed just to keep um, the lights on <clears throat> and heat and AC going in all the buildings. And that's because we wanted some amount of electricity available for car charging. Um, focus was put on shared uh, car use. And I'm here to tell you, it is a tricky thing to get that done and insure it. <laughs> you can do it uninsured, but not a good idea. So we're creating a special corporation where residents actually become shareholders and it's far more complicated than I ever imagined, but that is what we are gonna have to do because shared transportation is a big deal. Um, all of us know how often cars are just sitting in your driveway. Um, and so we have two smart cars right now that will be coming online when the corporation is uh, legal work is completed. Um, opportunities to reduce carbon footprint. Um, these are smaller but important. Um, many people don't think about the embodied carbon in a gallon of municipal water. Turns out there's a lot. Um, that water is pumped um, usually to a water tower. It's pumped through filters. It goes through the whole chemical treatment process and then it comes out your faucet or goes into your toilet. And I, we've always thought it was really stupid to use that energy intense water for flushing toilets. So we were able to get special permits from the state um, that allows us to collect in a 90,000 gallon cistern um, rainwater, which we then filter and pump back to the houses. Um, transportation, bike storage, make sure it's as easy as possible to use your bike. So that means there's a spot to keep it out of the weather that's secure. If you park your car under the parking canopies there, you can charge your car for free. There's always um, uh, a um, car charging port at the driveway of every residence. Um, again, eat plants, I talked about that. Um, rooftop gardens as well, I'll add that. We looked hard at green roofs and as a landlord, I've, I've had way too many bad, bad experiences with leaks I couldn't find were difficult to, to uh, correct. So we went, we have a concrete um, a roof deck uh, for the one bedroom and units in the townhouses. And we went to containerized um, um, agriculture up there. So each resident has their own choice as to how many containers they would like, but we encourage that. And we have the strength as you'll see later in these in the building design to do that. So um, no limit there. Oh, hold on, let me go. Um, composting. Um, Domestic hot water generation. Um, that was that's a big one. Um, as anyone knows, when you try and push down the energy uh, footprint of multifamilies, um, it's a big one. And we wound up using a Sandin uh, heat pump that uses CO two refrigeration. We'll talk more about that, but we found it was phenomenal. Um, lastly, resident energy awareness. Uh, the data will tell you later on that. It's really important. Um, we will talk a bit more about that, but uh, our results show that someone who's really conscientious can hit Woofy and Passive House numbers easily. And if you're not as inspired, um, you won't. So you can't build a Passive House person. <laughs> um, landlords don't control that. We do our best to create a Passive House um, envelope. 
So the other piece that uh, I think is really important um, to think about for a minute is resilience. And we often hear about um, various features. I think one of the most important is community in, in a storm condition. So uh, looking out for one another and knowing the special needs of those in your community is really important. Part of our focus in this project is encouraging interaction. So um, we have a common house, we have uh, din common dinners and so forth planned. So um, great deal of focus on that. These buildings that we've designed can get wet and can dry easily. Um, more on that later. The envelopes are non-combustible. The siding is MGO, magnesium oxide um, siding, and, um, and also our very high wind um, um, construct. Uh, 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 they have a great ability to withstand very high winds. And then, of course, there's electric backup um, in the event of power loss from the grid. And we are still working on that feature. It certainly will include batteries. Um, don't know yet about it, it, it if it will be necessary to get into a generation or not. Um, we don't think so. So this is the site. Um, uh, can people see my cursor? Karen, can you? Okay, so this is a 10 unit building here in the upper right corner that's that's been occupied for a year now. Um, this is Cottage Court. We are, uh, we just got all the roofs on and we're almost finished all the framing inside on this eight unit building here. This is the 10 room SRO, single room occupancy structure. This is a large parking area with solar canopy structure um, that uh, alone, I believe is 150 kW, is that right? Um, and subsequent phases are a 12 unit and then a 18 unit building here. All right, so that's what it looks like um, mostly today, except the roofs are on down here, the large solar canopy here. The SRO is out of the corner, so we gave you a little snapshot from a drone to see it here. <clears throat> Cottage style throughout, um, Moscow Lynn Architects, awesome job on keeping it simple and elegant. Um, all right, so the units we created. Um, in the middle here, you can see the farmer's porch focus that is consistent throughout. All the plantings you see in the foreground um, I believe are edible. Um, we use a cork floor direct glue to the concrete slab. Um, and we have very large kitchens with lots of storage space. We're encouraging what we're trying to do. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that, you guys. We are we're trying we're trying and succeeding actually in um, inviting home owners, former home owners, to lease from us. So we're trying to bring the stability of renting uh, of owning a home into the the leasing model. That is so we. We have a very conservative uh, annual rent increase uh, number of, uh, of one and a quarter percent annually if you extend into your blocks. And the only caveat is that if the city were to shift our tax rate substantially, we would have to put that into the, um, uh, absorb that into rent rents as well. Oh, I have to go back full screen, to full screen. Are you guys seeing, you aren't seeing full screen now, are you? Uh, now we are. Okay. 
Um, yeah, so elegant and simple. Um, the you will see in a moment um, the specifics of the construction system, but triple glaze windows and doors all around. We used a, a window and doors from Bill Dow and Busman, who are have operations in Poland and in Germany. I cannot say enough good things about these windows. Uh, they're and and door frames. They're made from a Siberian larch, which is the most stable wood I have ever worked with. Um, and and because our wall system, which is a combination of concrete and EPS foam, and then MGO as you go outward, are so thick. Um, and the glazing systems being triple paned and the floors being uh, concrete above you. Um, these units are so quiet. It is um, something that, that residents remark on often. Um, and that's really important. Um, the serenity that people find is unique and a huge selling point for us. Um, it goes without saying that we don't want to hear what's happening in our neighbors' lives, and you don't hear. You have really nice sound is isolation uh, going on. All right, this is a quick shot. Uh, it's easier to explain the building system after you've watched this quick video. Um, that gives you the basics of how a wall panel is constructed. So we are, we are building full walls from footing to peak um, in one fell swoop um, and then tilting them up. So um, the, um, you cannot call me a technical nerd for sure. Um, concrete and embodied carbon, um, best laid plans here. We, we, our plan was to partner with Carbon Cure out of Canada. Um, they figured out how to take industrial waste CO2 and inject it into your ready mix batches. Um, the only batch plant close enough to us was, well, it wasn't close enough to us. It was, I think is in Hadley, Mass. Um, and nobody close to Boston has incorporated this yet, which is a real bummer. They just won the $12 million Carbon X prize. Um, and I spoke with them today. They are working with Boston Sand and Gravel. Um, so, because obviously we're using a lot of concrete here, I happen to be a big fan of concrete um, and we have to solve the uh, embodied carbon issue in, in the material, but um, we are well aware of that. A quick shout out, not a quick shout out, a big shout out to DOER um, for really getting design focus on energy uh, conservation. Um, early, early on, four years ago, I think at least, um, they uh, launched Pathways to Zero grant program. And um, in exchange for the grant, we are sharing now with them all the data 
on um, the unit types that we've created. Um, also, Bryburn Architects, Chris Briley um, and Hans um, Bro uh, have been awesome in doing our woofy modeling work prior to construction, trying to figure out how to make this work. And then of course, Mike Brown, who probably is on now uh, at Advanced Building Analysis. Couldn't have done it without him, um, including this presentation. So design efficient technology, Zender, uh, ERVs, Q350s for the two bedrooms and 200s for the one bedrooms and a one of each for the three bedrooms. Um, mini splits, one to one, the 6,000 BTU model, which is the smallest they make. And I mentioned earlier the sand and domestic uh, water, hot water heat pumps. Um, can't say enough good things about that. You'll see in a moment just how um, well those are performing. All right, air tightness. Um, Betsy, I, in our best one, we beat you in one unit. That's, uh, that, that was this is my goal in life to have a really good air tightness um, value. And the next building, we think we can have even tighter. Um, we generally got really good results. One of those reasons is that when you cast your concrete wall panel uh, around your window bucket system, it does a great job of finding cavities and nesting everything well together. Um, we also use SEGA air barrier everywhere. Um, on the outside of the EPS phone. So we're very proud of this number. <clears throat> um, this, whoops, second floor, whoops, did we start on one bedroom bathroom? Yeah, um, one bedroom units. Uh, there's as much, well, not quite, but almost as much outdoor space um, on the roof deck as there is on the inside. And so we've focused a lot on outdoor living spaces. Um, modest, but really uh, elegant um, Mitsubishi unit here. Um, A-Wear monitors, a quick mention of those. Uh, these were selected with the help of Mike Brown at ABA. Um, we're measuring um, temperature, humidity, CO2, TVOCs, particulates, and even ambient noise um, at all times in every unit. Um, and I think we are, it's recorded on 10 minute intervals. So we have a really rich um, uh, data ability to mine, um, to, to, to just tweak and make adjustments as we move forward. Um, the downstairs oh, um, are, I've lost the square, I can't quite see the square footage, but whatever, we're 875 square feet. Um, again, modest in size, but tall ceilings, super quiet, elegant and simple. Um, we allocate um, a percentage of our large, solar array or arrays on site to the households um, leasing from us. So a two bedroom is allocated the production of a equivalent of a four kilowatts, four kilowatts of our system. And if they don't um, meet the needs of their energy with that four kilowatts, that's when they start paying for their electric. Otherwise, um, what is generated by their allocation of solar panel should cover their energy needs. More on that later. Um, oh, and this is this is just a three bedroom unit. So it's a it's the one bedroom with the generous rooftop patio upstairs and all of the downstairs, a front farmer's porch and a rear trellised um, patio. So
so these are the images um, of, let's see, this is, these are all first floor images. Um, oh, one second, lower right corner here is second floor. We did incorporate a large loft, um, which provides a huge amount of storage with a generous uh, uh, um, rigid stringer uh, pull down staircase. Um, that's been a huge help again, because people usually are selling their home and moving here. Uh, this is a couple views, the outdoor living space. Again, big focus, Keith uh, and his crew, John Fenton and Sarah Carlisle put on creating outdoor spaces, um, putting an equal emphasis on those two indoor spaces. Um, not mentioned is we, we have hot and cold water and non-potable water for irrigation um, on the patio spaces. Uh, you're seeing the early plantings, uh, permaculture design uh, swinging into action here. Um, and we, uh, in the, on the left image there is our water feature. We, we found um, on site basically a spring. And so what we do is we cycle the water from the spring up to the top of the hill. And the granite on this site uh, all is salvaged from the Route 95 Whittier Bridge project. Um, and it was very nice, the demolition company uh, to drop 800 of these off at our site free of charge because they had to get rid of them fast. We were just at the right place at the right time. Um, shared space, uh, common house that you see on the right. Um, again, lots of outdoor space as well as um, rooftop patio space, but we're encouraging interaction. Um, only rocking chairs, uh, black rocking chairs are allowed on front porches. That's, that's an important part of our FIAS model right there. So what happened? Um, we did all this modeling with Hans Bro and Chris Bryburn and Mike Brown. What happened um, after a year of living there? And what happened is really interesting. Um, we exceeded our power demands. Um, now we're looking now at all uh, 10 of the units uh, aggregated here. Um, so base load, so everything excluding uh, your hot water was about 4,300 kilowatts. And our hot water though was only 1,023 kilowatts. Um, and what you see on the right is what our WUFI models told us we were going to um, have when complete. Now, the big question is, what impact did COVID have? And we are not sure. Um, COVID wrecked a lot of things last year. And um, so we had a lot of residents who were at home who would otherwise not have been, a lot of kids who are at home who would otherwise not have been. So we're feeling pretty good about these numbers. Um, and when we dug into each unit and looked at temperature management, the people who hit or, or uh, used less energy than our WUFI model and what we allocated for solar were people who manage their thermostat like an old Yankee. <laughs> so if you set your thermostat to 68 um, in the winter and not above um, or not below 70, I can't remember what it was, 74 um, in the summer, you hit our numbers just fine. Um, we have a Tesla living at unit five. Um, and well, I don't want to get too personal with people here, but uh, 
we have a lot of information to dig into here to understand why readings are where they are. Um, because we have common hot water, so we have one hot water system uh, 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 fueled and, and heated by the sand and heat pumps and with a big recirc loop on it. Um, we all know from going to our conferences that um, recirc loops are always a hazard to our energy performance. Um, we found here that we did really, really well. We have a lot of the people, we, because we have separate hot water system, we meter hot water and cold water per unit. The only utility that a resident pays on top of rent is sewer and water. Um, and for that reason, we, we had to monitor both. So we've monitored uh, when hot water enters a unit, it's being metered as does the cold water. Um, these are adjusted right now for, for toilet flushing as well. Um, talk more about that later. Um, and here we are again with um, baseload annual monthly consumption numbers. Hot and cold water. Um, you can tell what households do laundry with cold water and hot water. <laughs> if it's 50-50, uh, the way I'm seeing this, um, or, or more cold, they are cold water clothes washers. We'll be giving awards for that um, trait to residents shortly. Um, water, we, we put a lot of focus on water. Water, water is a big deal. And um, in New England, we're fortunate to have a lot of it, but it, it, it costs a lot of money to manage in the first place and to clean and so forth. So we, we put a bunch of emphasis on this. You can see the state generally, to the best of our knowledge, anyhow, they're still at six, about 65 gallons per person per day or 130 gallons per bedroom, uh, which is a, is a lot of water. I, I don't quite understand yet. Um, I know that Woofy model had six gallons a day per person. Um, so I'm assuming that's 12 gallons in all, but I, I wasn't able to tighten up that data for us this evening. All right. Um, this slide's from Mark Rosenbaum, who I, I hope is here tonight, um, because in passive house design, there's a lot of fretting that goes on about um, even heat and cooling distribution in a home. And one of the points of passive house is to make your envelope so tight that your your equipment, your capital cost in equipment is reduced significantly. Well, you lose that advantage some when you have to go piping all the heat or cooling around the unit. So um, with the AWARE monitors, we had a unique situation that, that I, I thought I'd share with the group. Um, in a two bedroom unit, the furthest room from the 6,000 BTU wall cassette um, the resident thought it was quite a bit cooler, maybe, wasn't sure. And so we put an AWARE monitor at the same elevation in the room as the monitor in the hallway to see exactly what we got. Um, and the numbers were really close. Um, so these, so this is, uh, let's see, this was, what time, this was March, was it? This, the time frame was uh, November to July. Okay, so this is November to July, averaged. Um, and I think we have a slide here that shows you the graphed uh, temps with outdoor temp and then temp of bedroom and then temp in basically hallway living room. This is the layout. So you can see in the uh, light green in the far right is where the AWARE monitor was in the bedroom. Purple is where the AWARE monitor was at the core of the unit. And then the cassette is to your left. 
Now, um, someone can correct me if I'm wrong here, but my understanding is that although you have with the Mitsubishi, the hand cassette, the, the temperature sensing and the on off behavior of the unit um, is done at the unit, not at the cassette, the hand cassette. I could be wrong on that, but that's relevant to this discussion because we found such a small delta, which essentially we, we were running very even on, on um, heating and cooling distribution. Um, again, you, you know, this particular resident um, uh, did usually have their bed door, bedroom door open. We've talked ad nauseum about undercut doors or grills, what have you. Point being here, we're, we're only a one and a half degree off. And I think even if a door was closed, it wouldn't be an issue. And this is a graph of outdoor temperature at the bottom. And then you've got at the top, I believe, is the, the hallway uh, monitor. And at the bottom is the bedroom monitor. Um, so big thank you. I have no idea how I did for time. But um, again, thank you, Aaron, for having us uh, speak tonight. And Nat Coughlin, um, I'll blame him for getting me here in the first place. But would never have dug this deep into the numbers without the incentive of having this presentation tonight. So I, I do appreciate that. And of course, Hans and Mike and my family, Sarah Holden, Tyler Murray, and thousands of other people who made this whole thing possible. And we still have a long way to go. Well, uh, thank you, David. Excellent presentation. and and. Tremendous projects there. The, the data you have is amazing. I'm really, so I'm glad you took the time to put that together and show us. Um, I'm sure folks will have a lot of questions about it. Uh, we do have some time for questions, so I, I want to ask both of you. I'll give folks a couple more minutes to ask questions to David in the chat room. Betsy, I do want to go back to you for a second because there was a question during your presentation um, about your about the uh, heating and, and hot water systems you're using. You mentioned it's all electric, but what are the systems you're using there? Um, that work? Okay. Yep, that worked. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the hot water, sorry, I'll, the hot water system is a hybrid um, heat pump. It's a, a uh, Stibel Eltron and um, works really well. It's put in a um, mechanical room where obviously it's making the air cold and it's next to some equipment for um, audio that will make the room hot. So it's a nice complement um, in location. The um, air source heat pump system, we've got two branch boxes delivering to nine zones. Um, they're all, you know, recessed up into the ceiling. They're not these ugly cassettes on the wall. And um, that's, you know, seems to be working really well um, as under ERV. Um, and the commissioning for that, you know, I was told was going to be really tough and we're going to have to do it many times and, you know, actually didn't, didn't work out to be, um, much of a problem at all. So we've been, we've been very happy with, with all the MEP. There was also, um, a question about smart, smart house monitoring. Yes. Um, the, because this was a, it is a spec home, um, I didn't really know what people would be interested in and in monitoring. Um, if it had been my home, I would have uh, monitored the indoor air quality. Um, but I decided just not to put more gizmos into the house um, to really, frankly, confuse people. We do have a couple of things that are all already um, in there. We have a, a booster for the, the Zender um, system in each of the bathrooms and in the kitchen. Um, is one button. There's another button um, that is a booster for the hot water. Um, so that delivers hot water in, within 30 seconds. And then we also have um, another temperature uh, panel that is for the, um, for the radiant heat floors um, in each of the bathrooms. So I just didn't want to add um, too much extra stuff. Um, the uh, the disappointment that I had, I, I, you know, paid up for putting in Leviton panels for the electrical panels, 
um, got two of them and um, they're internet enabled. And so I had visions of being able to download the data from each of the different circuits, you know, made sure the, the electricians labeled them incredibly well. Um, I was hoping that I would get the homeowner to be able to, you know, had give me access to that, and, you know, so that I could work my spreadsheets and um, have found that the Leviton product is really um, not where it should be for, you know, this day and age, frankly. Um, yes, you can, you can dial into it from your phone, but um, it's more used as a diagnostic system. If one of your circuits is down and you're away, you can you know, troubleshoot. Um, you can't upload it into a spreadsheet. You can look at you know, the past month or the past year of any circuit usage, but you can't save that in, in a data format. So you can take a screenshot on your phone. But um, so I looked into to, you know, using SiteStage, um, which Nick has done with Auburndale Builders. Um, because there's so many circuits in this house, just it would be, it would be a bit of a nightmare um, to put um, that many circuit interrupters on each of these circuits and um, be very expensive. And so again, I, it's very difficult when it's a spec house, you know, who's going to pay for that? Am I going to pay for, you know, whatever. And I've used SiteStage before and it's not without, you know, errors. So that that's another, it's down. Can I come into your house and, you know, f fiddle with it? So in any case, I'm just going to rely on um, electric bills, which I did put in the, in the purchase and sale that, <laughs> I'm requiring them to give me electric bills. So that's that's my low tech um, way of hopefully capturing future data. That's great, Bessie. That's a, I, I like that method of, of making sure you get data, though at least putting it in the contract. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing you, you talked a lot about, and this that question actually for David, but I want to preface it by something you talked about, which is how in the marketing, the, the net zero aspect of those was front and center, passive house a little bit, but then the owners who ended up buying it are very curious about the passive house elements. You're giving them a tour, kind of highlighting the passive house elements. And David, I'm kind of curious for you, when you've been you know, marketing this to potential tenants, how are you positioning these, these, these homes? Is this, are these, are is passive house a part of it? Is net zero a part of it? What is getting people's interest to living here? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And, um, it has been extremely um, rewarding to those of us on the team to see the response and the, the real emotional desire um, to do something different and to live in a manner which is more friendly to the planet. And, um, and, and this project offers people that ability. So they are extremely enthusiastic. And it's a, it, it's more than, obviously it's more than just passive house, right? You know, permaculture, transportation, community, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot going on here, but definitely all, all aspects, including the energy efficiency of passive house is a, a big seller and, and, and very effective. And we're then the people who are coming to us are lovely people. Uh, yeah. It's been really nice. What if I could just interrupt? One thing about Passive House um, and being the foundation of the whole net zero energy. You know, my buyer is not that worried about their electric bill. Um, yeah. It's just not the biggest factor. I mean, being net zero is sort of a maybe a bragging point. Um, they definitely, people like solar arrays on their house. That's something that, you know, they're into as being sort of an environmentalist. Um, the passive, you walk into this house and it is solid. And David talked about the quietness, um, you know, Cambridge, I mean, this is a quiet little corner, but you know, Cambridge is still an, an urban site in general. And um, you just, Oh my gosh, you, you just walk in, you feel that the solidness of the, of the house. And, you know, I always say, let's open the windows and get some, you know, so that we can hear the birds, <laughs> but it's, um, you know, so how do you, how do you value that and people's, you know, sort of in the marketability of it? I mean, they just, they know that it's, that it's um, a different type of construction altogether. And they feel that, you know, when they open the doors and the windows, they yes. feel it. Yeah. They love those opening those doors and windows. 
So there's a lot of, and, and the indoor air quality, you know, already in the basement. I mean, people walk down and they're like, wow, this is, you know, this doesn't feel, smell, look like a basement. And so that really, for me, you know, enables me to capture a much higher, you know, value for, mm -hmm. for, for the area. I think that's a great point. And maybe, you know, we talk a lot about passive house as the term, but for, for most people, maybe that doesn't mean a whole lot, but they get inside this house and they, then they know what it means. They, they understand the difference. Um, they feel it. Um, you mentioned indoor air quality, of course, and I'm, I, there was a question about that as well in terms of monitoring. Um, David, you mentioned you're using these AWARE systems. They, are they measuring any indoor air quality things as well besides temperature? Yeah, so temperature, humidity, CO2, TVOCs, so total mm -hmm. volatile organic compounds, even particulate, um, ambient noise. We, we can't record people. It's just a sort of general sound. Mm -hmm. Let me emphasize that. Um, and I think that, and oh, and light too, actually. Okay. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so it's, and, it's a pretty broad spectrum. And, and it, it, we've been very happy with, with the product. Um, okay. and, and this is a, I'll just share with you this quick story. So we, we have these in our units. Um, we have an apartment uh, up in Jackson, New Hampshire, and we put one in that unit. We have a gas range up there. And I, I, so I ran the results back to the dashboard and then I was comparing our apartment and these houses. <laughs> there, there is just no comparison. You turn the gas stove on in a little apartment like that and your air quality goes right to hell on a hand basket. It, it is amazing um, how you see the impacts of, of these things um, with these monitors. So uh, Betsy is right. There are real, I think air quality is a really big deal. Um, and people appreciate the fact that, you know, you, you've got 24 seven air filtration going on um, and you notice it, you, you, you can sense it in the, in the, in the units. That's great. Um, we are over time at the moment. So I, I think we do have to call it for the evening. Uh, Betsy and David, thank you both for, for presenting tonight. Uh, these were excellent presentations. Uh, everything you put together was, was tremendous. And I'm really excited to see both of these projects.